So we'll make this short because everybody wants to go to the break and also to the to the event later today. So um, the idea is to show you a little bit more on a broader context of, of, of disasters in the world and narrowing a little bit on, on what has happened in our region and in the, in the last flo um, floods, especially in the water and sanitation, water, um, sanitation and, and hygiene. Um, and so very, very quickly, um, disasters have been happening lately and they are increasing with years. There's a tendency that disasters are increasing. Number of fatalities, fortunately, they are decreasing in the year, so there's this tendency going down. However, the number of people affected in disasters is increasing, and it's increasing very much. So when we put all these, these lines or statistics together, we can see that there is a, this blue area of people that are surviving disasters. And the question to you and to uh, the water utilities and the population is, what kind of quality of life we're having after disasters? And this is, relates to all the different sectors, but also especially to, to, to the water and sanitation. The cost of disasters is really increasing. Lines are, are I mean, this is a, a a graph from, from the reinsurance company, Swiss Re, and the costs are increasing every year. I mean, we live in a society that has more uh, infrastructure, more values, accumulation of these urban areas um, in places where um, we are kind of invading nature, and now we are creating more and more risk. And I say we are creating because the risk is a, is a as we will see a little bit further, is a combination of natural hazards, the exposure, infrastructure, people, and the vulnerability of that infrastructure versus that hazard. So it, it, it is a bit complex, but there are things that we can do to reduce that risk, and we'll see a little bit in further. Just to, to statistics in, in, that, in, in between 1980 and 2011, more than 3.5 trillion US dollars were, uh, was the impact of, 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 of disasters. And most of it, 78% was weather related. Um, and this is happening everywhere in the world. This is just a snapshot of what happened in 2013 in, in the different regions. We had uh, floods um, in Europe, yeah, the biggest Actually, it was the, the, the biggest uh, event that caused uh, the most expensive uh, economic impact of disaster last year. But looking a little bit from the eyes of, of, of the water and sanitation, what are these impacts in, in the different disasters? And I will bring you a couple of examples. Hurricane Katrina was a wake-up call in so many, so many ways for, for different uh, sectors and, and United States. And you can think United States, Japan, countries that have invested in risk reduction. But when we see this kind of, of, of floods uh, and, and, of course, the hurricane, um, we are exposed to, to, to this um, negative events in the different sectors. Just to be uh, more precise, there were more than 1,000 drinking water systems and 172 sewers that were damaged. And the, most, the problem of that is that almost 2.5 million people were without access, of, without access to, to water, to drinking water. Um, and here, I mean, I'm showing this because the, the impacts of the disasters in the, in the short term are very big. And we, we saw all of this televised. And, and, and the stress that we put for drinking water and the quality of this water, and especially sanitation. Because look at all these people where they, they, they need to go to the bathroom. 
And in order to recover the, the, the sanitation part, all the sewage and all of that, you need to wait until the waters reside. So it's a stress, a constant stress to, 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 to your sector. Then we have a more recent 2010 the earthquake in, 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 in Haiti. Of course, all the infrastructure was destroyed, but here I want to highlight the fact that because of poor sanitation and, 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 and lack of, 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 of preparedness in this area, we had a big outbreak of cholera. And it, this, this was the, the first out, outbreak of cholera after um, 100 years, and, and in Haiti. I mean, it, it is not the most developed country in the world, but 100 years we were able to control this disease. And because of the disaster and the consequences of it, they, they, they got badly heated. Peru, 2007, the earthquake. Um, the, here's a, a nice study of what happened in, in the area of Puno, where they had around $30 million uh, impact in the, in the sector. So when we asked and, and did some studies there, they were saying that with $30 million, they could have done 8,000 water connections, 7,000 drainage systems, and benefiting 160,000 people. So, once we get hit, we will pay for the disaster. But we will pay for the disaster with the money that we have for investment, for maintenance, and from, for development. So this money doesn't come from, from donors anymore, because we, are, we have this, this, this problem of saturation. We have so many emergencies going around that your emergency has to be the most catastrophic event on that year in order to get funding. And that is not happening. And I wanted to put the, the example of Japan, because it's the most prepared country for disasters. They get hit, you name it, every kind of disaster, they have it. And the, the, the tsunami in earthquake tsunami and the Fukushima crisis show us the complexity of disasters in the different systems. So for example, the they were estimating around 1.4 million people in 14 prefectures that didn't have access to water. And when asking the, the mayor of Sendai how long it will take to restore the water and sewer services, they are thinking about four to five years. Because there's still damage until today. There are still places where there was not reconstruction because they are having a conscious and process to, 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 to think how they want to rebuild the, 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 the towns, the cities. And this is engaging an, on uh, several different um, institutions. And I, I will show you a little bit more ahead what are the different institutions that need to be involved. As we mentioned, what we heard in the presentation before, it, it, this is not just a one institution issue. So uh, what happened in the Balkans, we heard a little bit, uh, I mean, a lot <laughs> before, but I want to focus on the impact of, of the economic impact of disasters and a little bit on the human side as well. As you can see, the total uh, economic impact in Bosnia and Herzegovina was 15% of the GDP. And we saw with analysis, economic an, an analysis, that this is going to increase poverty in the country in between 0.4 and 1.8 percent. This is, this is not good. Um, and then in Serbia, we have a 5 percent of the GDP. And these numbers, what, what they mean, 15 percent, 5 percent of GDP, just to put in context, the growth in the economies of last years was uh, one, two, and when we had excellent cases, 3%. So 15 and 5% are a lot. And uh, when we look at the, the Human Development Index um, in Serbia, for example, we, we see that in 2014 will be a decline on, on, on that index. So it's not only economic 
affectations to the population, but is what this economics does to the population. I think you see you have seen these these pictures where the 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 affectation was in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And this is a little bit on the I'm covering you here, so sorry. Um, on how much was the cost on the water and sanitation. And if you see it, it, it is not a big affectation compared to other um, to other sectors. However, the question is, what would you do with this money if you had that available for your institutions? What was the, the damages were physical, of course. They were in electrical components, pumping stations, public uh, administration buildings, um, vehicles, etc. And uh, in, in, in wastewater structures were infrastructure as well. <coughs> now in, in, in Serbia, we had more or less the same affectation where also the sector was not as bad affected as all the, all the other sectors. I'm running so we can go to the questions. So more or less same kind of, of, of the affectations. Now, coming to, to the, the session, how we can be more resilient to disasters? How can we reduce? First thing is that we need to understand that we are very exposed to different kind of disasters or natural events, I must say. Uh, we, we heard that floods occur every single year in the region. I mean, the floods in 2014, they were extraordinary, but still there is no consensus to say that it was a hundred or a thousand year return period. I mean, there are very uh, differences on, on that. The point is that we have floods every single year. They are big, small, large, medium, but from the past, we have been having recurrent events every two or three years. Actually, the World Bank had a project in 2004 for the floods of 2004. Two in, in, in it was 2002, 2003 in Serbia. Um, so this is happening, and floods are not the only hazard that these countries are exposed. There are um, landslides, which were pretty much what caused most of the damages in infrastructure in, 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 the, in, the, in the different sectors. Um, earthquakes. Earthquakes were. We're not talking too much about earthquakes, but our region is very exposed. Just look 50 years ago in Macedonia. Skopje was completely destroyed. If we look back, also we know that Banja Luka was, had a, a very important earthquake. And now we have much more population, much more infrastructure, and how these buildings were constructed, we don't know. I mean, we hope they are certain building codes, but the, the studies we, we, we see, they are not very positive. And you, you, even if we start looking back, 1800s or 1400s, we know that, for example, Zagreb was destroyed two or three times for earthquakes. And when you look at the development plan of the EU with the country, you don't see a word of earthquakes in that. So it, it, it is worrisome. We have neglected disasters in this region until they happen, and then we are reacting. So one of the first things is, is also to be aware of, of what are the hazards and what are the risks. As I was mentioning before, very quickly, um, we cannot do much against just the hazard. We cannot have a super umbrella that will cover the whole country. We cannot have, um, uh, we cannot intervene to, to earthquakes as the event. But yes, we can make the infrastructure that we have flood resistant, earthquake resistant, or build, as it was mentioned before, our critical in in infrastructure in places where we know that they are not going to be flood, flooded, or in, in places where we can have protection of those infrastructures. Um, 
we know, for example, uh, an example in, 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 uh, in Serbia that uh, it was very upfront. It was a very uh, Obranovic, Obranov, Obrenovac, sorry. Um, the hospital there had new equipment for uh, x-rays and uh, dialysis. All of this equipment were in the basement. So you, you, you didn't need a 100 euro, 200 year return period flood to get those equipments um, destroyed. So we look at the vulnerability of, of this infrastructure. And then once we understand that, we can reduce that vulnerability so we can reduce the risk. And how we do it this in our sector? You need to understand what is the risk in your system, in your network. And every single part of your network in your system is exposed to a, a hazard. And it has a vulnerability in relation to that hazard. So this is just to, 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 to illustrate that there is a complexity on this, but we need to understand it in order to reduce it. And there are even more complexities because you are not alone. You are interlinked with different uh, other sectors. For example, transport sector bridges. There are pipes that go into the bridge. If that bridge is not well done or has uh, certain mitigation measures, the bridge is going to collapse. And then your system is going to collapse. We need to be able to connect with the different sectors, civil protection for uh, the evacuations, uh, hydromet to receive the, the warnings and alerts, uh, and to know what to do with our system. I'll mention health sector, transport. So, there is a, a, a several people that need to be on the table to discuss this. So, just to summarize, resilient society needs to be uh, built in, in three big um, areas. One, we need to be able to respond and recover more efficiently. And when I say respond, it's not just the civil defense, it's every single sector. How much we can afford to be not in service. Huh? Um, second is we need to start reducing the existing risk. Today we have uh, infrastructure that is in risk. How much of your infrastructure is earthquake proof or flood proof or is not under a mountain that is going to uh, have a landslide? We need to start mitigating this. this uh, risks. And we have to be able to avoid the creation of new risk. We know that climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of these events. We know that we have uh, years of accumulation of, several, of, 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 of earthquakes in our region. They are going to happen. But if we continue investing or putting money to build infrastructure in areas that we know that is going to be flooded, or they are not with the proper building codes, we are going to continue <coughs> this creation of risk. Reduction of risk is, 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 is linear. It's very, very, very difficult to, to reduce the risk. But the creation of, 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 of risk is exponential. It's just the accumulation of, of infrastructure in our, in our societies building more, we, we, we are in a, in a society where most of the 50% is, is urbanized. And, and this is very, very critical. So just to, to fi finalize, behind these numbers, behind these statistics, there are people. And these are the people you're working for to provide the services that you do in your day to day. And that is the main message for me in this, is that Regardless what happens with disasters, events of earthquakes, floods, we need to be prepared to continue to provide the services that we have been mandated. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, good afternoon, everybody. I am coming from Belgrade, Serbia. I used to work for a long period of time for Belgrade Waterworks. 
but uh, nowadays I'm much more engaged on this international cooperation and uh, as Philip said, uh, we, uh, I'm the president, current president of the IAWD International Association of Water Companies here at Daniel Catchment Area. But <clears throat> uh, I, will, I will give some overview about uh, how, how water companies responded in these cases and uh, what, what actually happened from the perspective of, of the of the water supplying companies. So I, we use the same sources, so just a few slides about the context. Uh, it was not said that this cyclone, this uh, was named Tamara, so very nice name, but for this uh, not so nice happenings afterwards. That was the precipitation map of Europe at that time. This dark blue is uh, Serbia and Bosnia. So we already saw this, uh, that uh, we had this uh, outstanding or not expected uh, rainfall levels. It was promoted, uh, the red uh, meteorology, uh, meteorological alarm on the May 20th about the, the, uh, the uh, heavy rains coming. So it was already explained that uh, that uh, from expected 100, we have almost 300 liters per square meter or 300 millimeters. And uh, this caused this uh, extreme, a very extreme uh, increase in, 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 the, in the levels of the rivers. So, so uh, for instance, at Zapadna Morava River, as you see, uh, this ever historical maximum went up for 220 centimeters. And uh, some of the 42 uh, areas uh, susceptible to flooding been affected out of uh, 42 been uh, affected out of 99 uh, recognized in the river in the republic of serbia and those uh, red lines are the rivers which caused this this these problems so the flood defense uh, failed uh, we had so much dike failures but uh, explained by by uh, uh, marina babic so i will come to the water problems or water supply problems very soon. So, <clears throat> as that happened at some places overnight, we had to react immediately and uh, first priority was for sure to save people's lives. That was a very much confusing situation at this first day and the second when all the others been engaged to help and who can help and how but uh, very soon after, the system started to function. And those are, those are some places where, where they faced some, some real flooding uh, in the downtown parts of the city. This is Valjevo city where the whole infrastructure was destroyed, bridges, roads, etc. Uh, that's another, this is uh, the, the pictures from September. That's again, this happens, happened in May, but uh, in September we had this uh, uh, torrents in the eastern part of Serbia in the Jerdab Gorge. So those are the places where the water supply was endangered and that special measures had to be taken. And this is this famous Kolubara watershed where, where we recorded this uh, very high level, uh, uh, river levels and that we are discussing about the return period if it is really 1,000 years or a little bit less. But anyway, to all this area, we calculated according from the measurement points, uh, to this area uh, fell nearly 1 billion cubic meters of water in the period of less than three days. So that was a really, really huge quantities of water which had to be, uh, had to be, I don't know what. We had to wait for these rivers to, to flow safely through the country, but that was, that, that didn't happen. So it was uh, covered by, by media and everything. So I will, I will uh, concentrate my, my presentation on the city of Obreno. This is the, uh, the most downstream city or, or at the mouth of Kolubara River to the Sava River. So this city was uh, 
affected the most and and uh, they had uh, really big big problems for for the period of a couple of months uh, this is how the situation in the city looked uh, uh, as you know as mentioned that uh, the big two big very big uh, thermal power plants are placed there and uh, they've been even endangered themselves and uh, the both the supply of electrical energy was was endangered so that's the city how this looked and uh, we started with the crisis management that was that was the only 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 way to to cope with the situation so as the dikes and, and all this flood defense didn't work, uh, the city was flooded two, three meters, and uh, the status uh, of uh, alert of uh, emergency and uh, uh, it was emergency situation was declared. So that was a mobilization of all possible manpower and, and other stuff to, for help. So, so that was a very big campaign. And uh, that was a very good response after that, even international and, and, and the national. So the real rescue operations started. So that was first to rescue people, to take them out of flooded homes, children, everybody, these big boats being engaged for for movement to, to evacuation people from the city, even the hospitals have been rescued. Then animals, of course, livestock. That's very interesting how this pig came to the roof, but it happened. Then the cars were the big problems for everybody, yeah. And <coughs> that was how the, the whole area looked like. This is the entrance to the city of Brenovac. So it was after evacuation of 25,000 people, you were, you were not allowed to enter the city unless you have some special uh, permit. So uh, <clears throat> at this stage, I want to say that the Belgrade Waterworks uh, was very much engaged on, uh, in the city of Brenovac because uh, uh, Brenovac is the, one of the 16 <coughs> municipalities of, the, of, the, of the Belgrade, and uh, they have their separate water supply system. But we, as a big brother, we had to help them, and uh, we've been there with them for almost two months. So the water source of city of Brenovac is a system of wells uh, in a certain area. Those uh, red dots are, are the wells. They have been, of course, flooded all. Uh, they, they use some uh, type of wells with the horizontal laterals, but as well these uh, simple draw wells as well. So the capacity was, before the disaster, about 450 liters per second. You can see the flooded wells. And uh, water supply was cut off, of course. At the very beginning, the, the electrical power supply was down as well. Uh, the surface water was polluted from the sewage network. and. Uh, we, nothing could be done at that stage than waiting for the flood waters to, to recede. And uh, we had to provide the prompt uh, response for the first day to the remaining people in the city and uh, start with some rec restoration plans. So it was everything was supplied from water to food and everything. So that was one big campaign of collecting and bringing food to the spots and delivering to the people. And uh, of course, the problem of water, we solved through our international cooperation and uh, Budapest Waterworks offered us a very special uh, mobile unit, mobile water purification unit. 
and uh, they they been really fast and they they they, they came there down uh, in 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 one day so when when the general manager or our vice president mr chabaharangi called me offering me this kind of help when they learned about these big problems in in the vicinity of belgrade so <clears throat> i said yes that's a very good idea so what you what you what you recommend he said uh, we can start in next four hours. So I was pretty uh, ac uh, astonished or, or uh, with this proposal. So said, how come? So all my equipment is ready, my people are ready, so we, they can start. So after uh, formalities we had to solve at the very beginning, they really been uh, down in the Brenova city, not the same night, but tomorrow morning. So. That was a really quick response to, 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 to this, and that's, that's the model how, how this kind of uh, uh, emergency situations could be solved. Uh, of course, the plant was uh, completely uh, equipped with all necessary things, and that's the product. We had packed water of five liters, which we could deliver to the people. So that was, uh, that helped enormously to, the, to, to everybody. Uh, that they could have water as much as uh, as they like, and uh, and they they could even even come and uh, uh, fill up their own tanks with water. So so uh, that was a really very good very good support, and uh, and uh, everybody was happy about that. Uh, that's another unit which that was uh, it came with one uh, German team, and. Uh, they had a little bit different technology. They packed water in, in these jumbo plastic bags, so so that been uh, delivered and uh, placed at the, in the area where people could come and, and use the water. So, <clears throat> one of the critical infrastructure in the city of Reynolds was the sewers. So you couldn't start uh, your water supplying system be before you start and put in operation the sewerage system. So the main uh, sewage pumping station was underwater, so that had to be waiting. You can see the levels on the walls. Uh, uh, that uh, this first pump, this pumping station had to be started first, and after that we, we had to solve the blockages in the in the or mud blockages in the in the uh, sewer system, and uh, before we could think about starting the water supply. So. Uh, another another uh, very good thing was that we had this kind of pumps available and uh, uh, that we could uh, pump out the waters from the low laying parts once the uh, water level receded the remaining waters were in these uh, low lying areas so uh, then after the water was gone the local uh, landslides and everything caused different kind of damages on the system so one of the uh, sewer mains had to be repaired and as well as i mentioned all the all the all the sewer system to be flushed out and put in operation that's another inter interesting uh, you can see the manholes the the whole soil was washed out so 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 we can see that the manholes are remained in the street you know and uh, I think they, they did a good job. So they, they know how to build the main holes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm I'm out of time, but I will I will go quickly. That's another point. This is this is actually not uh, Obrenova. This is Valjevo. This is a big pipeline which was under construction. So this pipeline should be in the in the foreland, uh, on the left side of the city. But after after this uh, big floods, the 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 the, the Pipeline was taken, and now it's in the middle of the, in the middle of the Kuluba River. So that's the the Japan government took uh, some measures. Of course, at the end, everything has to be cleaned up. Some 50,000 tons of trash had to be removed. Then uh, the whole area has to, had to be disinfected. That uh, that's I, I would like to emphasize that uh, the, uh, during the whole period and after all these measures, there were no serious hygiene problems within the city. So uh, it was mentioned that some uh, post-disaster need assessment job been done, 
carried out by United Nations, EU, and the World Bank. So they gave some uh, uh, recommendations, and uh, they had a plan how to assess the whole whole damage, and uh, the main problems or, or main damage on the on the on the system where the uh, physical damage to the networks and uh, electrical components and uh, mechanical components of the pumping systems. And uh, of course, the, the companies been affected, they couldn't charge people for water supply, so they had uh, some lost revenues during this period. And uh, the all damage has been estimated at some 60 million euros. I have some doubts about all this. I think the whole whole story been done in relatively short time, and they didn't take in consideration some uh, aspects of of of, of uh, problems they could occur in 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 near future. But we could discuss this issue uh, on our panel afterwards. There's a total damage, as is what at it was mentioned, and. If the infrastructure is 1,092 million, transport takes 167. So that's the remaining 16. Uh, and um, I would say that that's again that uh, non-visible infrastructure is not so much so much important. So therefore, always all this kind of uh, uh, transport infrastructure and other things uh, they had uh, uh, completely different. Uh, approach than, than the water supply. And so those are the affected people, as it was mentioned. And uh, to re reduce the disaster, there are some uh, messages about that. So I won't read them. But uh, we, can, we can mention them uh, uh, afterwards on, during our panel. So I want to thank you very much. My name is Sandy Zulic, I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm president of Aquasan Network Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, this network is not only a network of water supply, utilities, water supply and sewage companies, it's also a network which uh, uh, work very much with the municipalities and also the higher level of authorities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I will start, uh, I use these uh, questions regarding the invitation which uh, Philip sent me and asked when I prepared this presentation, what are the lessons learned of, for water services and water utilities uh, regarding prevention of the floods. And I will speak today, I will also show you some photos and some events which are happening in Bosnia as it was in Serbia, but I will more concentrate on this presentation, what we really uh, do until now and uh, what we are planning actually to do in Bosnia and Herzegovina and what can or should be done for water utilities prepared for, uh, for and manage flood risks. I also want to, uh, you saw that most probably in a different diagram, but I also want to say about this uh, Disasters are increasing, and you can see here that uh, meteorological and hydrological events even more than climatological or uh, geophysical events. And this is the trend, as was uh, mentioned uh, before, and uh, from Joachim, from first presentation, and I will also try to say something what we do and what we are planning regarding this uh, disaster because also the I think that this approach to take all these uh, disasters and uh, appro uh, let's say all these concepts and uh, how to how to mitigate how to work with the risks and this need to be applied also in our countries here in the Danube River basin I think especially on the Western Balkan. You know this map, I, I think you already heard, uh, so that this was Danube River Basin, part of the Danube River Basin, but it's also, uh, we uh, analyze this as a regional, regional event, and uh, you can see that uh, three countries are damaged very much with this flood. It was, for Bosnia, it was north part, and uh, 
it was really, really, really disaster, as you probably saw. I put there in Bosnia because it was not happening in Herzegovina, but uh, uh, I think this damage are very uh, known and already showed, but it was really, uh, uh, we cannot talk, maybe it is 1,000 year flood, let's say like that. Like, like that. And another issue which is very specific for Bosnia are landslides, and you can see from this, uh, from these uh, photos that uh, even several hectares, we have uh, landslides with hectares, which damage a lot, not only houses and uh, infrastructure, uh, road infrastructure, but they, they damage a lot of water supply system and complete, some complete water supply system just disappear. And people uh, uh, were uh, left without, without water supply, without wa water. This is just one table from the physical plane or spatial plane from the Tuzla Canton. On the left side, you can see the number of the landslides they put, what they know, 2013, before, uh, before they start to prepare this spatial plan. And this was in this analyze before they, they start to planning. But in 2014, you have almost four times more Landslide from 1,800 to 5,200 landslides. Uh, this is one of the example where huge landslide just uh, uh, totally destroyed the pumping station and the pressure line of the this village. And this village is still struggling for water now. They are trying to repair that, but this this is actually. Uh, 250 houses lost uh, water supply. Impacts to the floods, just to summarize these things which are happened there, are many pumping stations, as, as Vladimir also mentioned, many pumping stations and reservoirs were destroyed or just, how to say, they, tr they travel actually to the valley. And many pumping stations and boreholes were flooded, contaminated, especially in Priador area. They, they, they rehabilitate recently this pumping station boreholes. They even increase the uh, uh, level of the pumping station, but still was not enough. Design was not maybe properly done and this pumping station and it was contaminated and uh, they had a lot of time to spend to wash out because recently they have this, uh, they put fertilizer on very huge area around the uh, uh, upstream than, than uh, this uh, borehole area. Many private wells also are contaminated. Uh, rural water supplies, as I said, had very, very uh, big quality, water quality problems, landslide interrupt water supplies, or just uh, a lot of networks just disappear. Uh, dike didn't collapse, but uh, we realized that they were very low, and maybe we cannot, in some areas, some cities in Boston, you cannot go with, uh, up with these dikes. It's just as, as lady before us uh, explained from the, from Serbia that we need really to find a solution how to live with that and how we can really uh, minimize this risk and how we can uh, mitigate some, some of these challenges. Because uh, also electrical shortcut, no chlorination, equipment told to, let's say, to maintenance this, uh, to, to recover this very fast you see this level of the pumping station, one meter approximately more. But this was happened, and I just came here and to say what we do, what we really need to do, and what, what we plan uh, to do as a, as a society there in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We had a flood in May. This was, uh, I show more or less pictures from the May, flood of May, but in August, in September, uh, October also, many of cities, many of uh, 
fabrics, maybe many of uh, infrastructure was or flooded or destroyed and somehow warn us there in, in uh, water sector to do something and we decide to organize the Takvas and organize a meeting or workshop regarding this uh, disaster risk reduction, but we call that prevention, pre preventive actions and disaster risk reduction because we realized that during these events that uh, only who actually, when you, when you analyze this uh, sector and uh, respond to these uh, uh, events, we realize more or less municipalities and waterworks, they react, let's say, somehow positive, but up, upper or uh, high level authorities, water agency, river basin agencies. I must say, maybe more critical. This is my opinion. They they lost themselves. They really they they didn't show that they have they are they have managers that they are managing this this risk. They didn't communicate. They didn't coordinate these th things. Alarm system was totally in collapse and. Uh, only municipalities, we see neighboring municipalities help each other and somehow try to, to decrease this damage. But what we do this, on this event, it is very important, is that we take this approach of the uh, disaster risk, new approach, new concept, uh, disaster risk reduction, trying, as Joachim start to explain or uh, explain on the beginning, try to see why we are not in all these, uh, our do uh, documents, our strategies, our projects, we are not considering these risks uh, or we are not trying to, let's say, assess properly them or put them somehow on site. It's important that we construct, that we work, that we cut the ribbon. We are not taking what will happen later on, what, how we will maintain that or how we will uh, uh, manage this with the, when we come to this situation as, as we saw, saw earlier. And uh, one of, the, of this uh, workshop or, or meeting, what we spend a lot of time, we try to provide new inputs, new approach to Bosnia and Herzegovina regarding this uh, uh, physical planning, st uh, spatial planning or, or strategic level planning, let's say like that, or, or water management planning to really to introduce uh, assessment of the proper assessment of the risks and also to really assess or to see how this re impact of these risks. And uh, you see that we divide complete uh, workshop on the four four groups, four groups of different levels, entity state level, then also the cantonal, municipal, and water utility level, let's say, or water utility group. And all of these groups came, uh, analyzed this through the SWOT analyze. I just put here the, this, what was done by the public water utility companies, accompanied with the, some, uh, some uh, uh, NGOs and uh, representative of development banks, but these are the main conclusion of this meeting, and I want to share with you that this really systematic and holistic approach regarding this risk management and implementation of prevention action is necessary, and basically all of these groups and all of these different levels, from the entity or state ministry to the what would they agree and say, let's say we need to change, we need to introduce new mechanisms, we need to introduce but not only in the water sector, also in other sectors. Then also we need really to strengthen Bosnia lost during the war and after the war a lot, a lot of uh, experts, a lot of people and uh, we really need to continue with the capacity and institutional building. Emphasizes on the, always on the exchange, knowledge, experience and practices because we realize that in a country we have a very good example so we can share, we can learn from each other. One issue which is very important is involvement of the citizens and public raising awareness and education. Their roles and responsibilities during the flood, they are very extremely important and uh, as 
on a site where they make this uh, negative impact or change. Uh, also, they are very important to this uh, part where, they, where we together as a society need to respond to the flood. Necessary amendments to existing laws, we realize actually uh, during this uh, also recovery needs assessment, we realize how we are weak according to some uh, laws and how, where we need to change and adopt the laws. Planning process, as I said, need to be improved on the strategic level. Let's say also this risk assessment, impact of the uh, risks, uh, risks need to be also done on the strategic level, but also on the project level. Special planning is one of the issues which is now a hot issue, and we realize that this, this damage, uh, this, this uh, improper planning really uh, increase our uh, damage uh, in such events. It is necessary also to significantly improve communications and coordination horizontally and vertically, and uh, we need to maintain and enhance this, all these uh, uh, structures which we already built and also new, build new, new ones. This was actually the, the conclusions of these uh, meetings. We already get the support from also from the donor side or, or from the international development banks for, uh, for such a concept. And uh, I think now that the uh, ministry are trying now to somehow put this in, a, in their plans, in the, their programs, that we really seriously tackle this uh, systematic and holistic approach in the future. This is everything from my side. Thank you very much. From Spring to Black Sea, the Danube River is about 2,800 kilometers long. Its catchment area, the Danube River Basin, compre comprises of more than 800,000 square kilometers, approximately 10% of uh, continental Europe. This basin is shared by 19 countries, making in the most international river basin in the world. Uh, I'm happy that I explained to you that on uh, 29th of June 1994, the Danube River Protection Convention was signed in Sofia, Bulgaria. Today, the Danube River Protection Convention has 15 con contracting parties, 14 countries, and European Union. The International Commission for Protection of Danube River implements the Danube River Protection Convention, but it also coordinates the implementation of two very important European directives in the uh, Danube River Basin, the Water Framework Directive from 2000 and the EU Floods Directive of 2007. Both of these directives require the development of management plans for the entire hydrological catchment. For flood risk management, the main tool to do this is the Danube River Basin Flood Risk Management Plan. The first Danube River Basin Flood Risk Management Plan is under preparation now and will be a able uh, to present it as a draft by the end of this year. It is based on the development of flood hazards and flood risk maps. This is one very important part of the preparation of the uh, plans, as well as a preliminary flood risk assessment and the identification of areas of potential significant flood risk. At the heart of uh, the management plan are measures such as wetland re recognition, 
the creation of potential spaces or uh, volumes uh, of the construction and improved management of dams. This, uh, this measures built on solidarity principle Affected regions need to find ways of dealing with floods and the way that takes downstream areas in, in, uh, into consideration. I would like to thank you for the an opportunity to discuss our uh, understanding of flood management in more detail after the presentation. Uh, something like a round table, and I will be here to answer uh, some question and to find connection between common uh, efforts from the International Commission and uh, water companies and uh, different authorities in the countries. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jelena Janevska, and I am the knowledge manager of NALAS. NALAS stands for a network of associations of local government authorities of Southeast Europe. So we are basically uh, bringing together 16 such associations from 12 countries of Southeast Europe, the whole former Yugoslavia, Moldova, Romania, Marmara region in Turkey as well. So whole Southeast Europe except Greece are members of our network. 16 such associations from 12 countries. Uh, our secretariat is based in Skopje, only by chance, but most of our activities are throughout Southeast Europe. Uh, the objective of the network is to uh, advance the process of decentralization and position the role of local governments vis-a-vis -vis central governments as well as to strengthen their capacities to improve the services provided to citizens. Uh, we do half-half uh, policy work and capacity building, so uh, I will, at the end of my presentation, direct you to NALA's website to learn more about our work. Uh, my presentation today will be very short. I was guided to prepare a couple of slides only, so I have only four. And I hope you won't think that I'm lazy and that's the reason why I have only four slides, but I just try to follow the um, uh, guidelines given and I can talk about this for hours if there is interest. Otherwise, I will be, as my ex-boss used to say, uh, short and sweet and hard to beat, I hope. Um, uh, I will present several things related to how NALAS network organized after the severe floods of May 2014, what we did, what kind of solidarity we showed with our members and their members, the municipalities of Southeast Europe. And then I will discuss something about the follow-up steps, what NALAS as a network will do in the future. I remember as it was yesterday when my boss called me on Saturday, I believe it was the 17th of May, where uh, when he got a call from our members from Serbia, the standing conference of towns and municipalities, who really uh, were uh, seriously consider, uh, concerned about the situation in Serbia and several municipalities, in particular Obrenovac at that time. So they asked us to do something and to mobilize the strength of our network. This was a real challenge for us. All we do, we do together, but this was uh, the first uh, that big disaster that we faced. So immediately on Saturday, we mobilized our team and we started to call our members individually, all 16 of them, and motivate them to organize on a national level to provide support to their peer municipalities in the hit countries. At that point, it was mainly Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia. Later on, it was Croatia. And during the summer, also Bulgaria uh, uh, was one of the countries that were hit by these floods. So we immediately talked to everybody, and our members immediately started to organize and provide support to the municipalities in Serbia, Bosnia, and later on Croatia. Uh, this was done during several months, and we didn't have any data what happened. We were just talking to them, getting partial data, so we decided to use one of our mechanisms. It's called quick response mechanism, where we 
uh, in a very short time collect information from our members about certain issues related to policy or other interventions they do. So we did a survey which focused on these four questions that you have on the slides, asking what the association did after the calls that were sent uh, from NALAS, and um, then what concrete support did they provide? What concrete support did their members, municipalities, provide it through the local government association? And uh, where the help, uh, the help went to? Uh, which municipalities from the hit countries were helped? Uh, in the next slide, I will present some of the results from this survey. Uh, the first conclusion is that there is no coordinated mechanism for support of municipalities during disasters. <laughs> Basically, uh, I will discuss this later on too, but everybody did what they thought was the right thing to do at that moment. Most of the things were done uh, intuitively. Uh, we provided some guidelines in our calls what people should do and whom they should approach and how they should organize and, and what ki kind of support is needed at the very moment. So we were keeping uh, sending this information over and over again and the only coordination went on local uh, government association level. I will speak about this a little bit later. So the first conclusion was that there is no mechanism that you can immediately activate and show some results. Uh, all member LGS reacted positively to the calls we, we sent. All of them got organized. All of them sent these calls to their members. Some of them uh, have uh, over 500 members, for example, uh, like uh, it's the case in some of the countries. So they contacted everybody, uh, shared this information via various channels. Some of them were more proactive, like Turkey, and Turkey provided the biggest assistance uh, from our network. They uh, immediately called all mayors from Marmara region uh, to Istanbul. They had a meeting. The president, uh, the mayor of Istanbul, hold this meeting. And they uh, discussed concrete things, how they will support their peer municipalities uh, in the flooded areas. Uh, the support was going either directly, municipality to municipality, or in most of the cases via the Red Cross. This is also an interesting finding. It again shows the first conclusion that there is no mechanism that can immediately be activated. So most of our members decided to leave this to municipalities. We were providing the links between the countries, but also most of the support went through the centralized um, uh, mechanisms. The Red Cross was recognized by our members as the most credible uh, organization. So even when the association collected the money, we had such cases, they uh, distributed the money through the Red Cross. I'm not saying this is necessarily good or bad, but it is how it was and it uh, shows where we should focus our attention on when it comes to solidarity between municipalities and local government associations in Southeast Europe. And then when we did the survey, uh, most of the association reacted that it was very difficult for them to collect the data. So they were sending partial data in most of the cases. And they said that they are aware that it has been much more that is done and collected uh, during these months, but they simply do not have the data. They asked their member municipalities and some of them provided the data, some of them didn't. Uh, also, some local government associations uh, send direct financial support to their peer local government associations uh, in the hit countries. And in most of the cases, local government associations had the role of coordinators. They coordinated municipalities that are their members in providing the support. I said that it was difficult to summarize uh, the responses we got or all the contribution uh, that came from our network, but in rough terms it would be around 250,000 euros financial support and over 3,000 tons of goods. Uh, again, it is very difficult to um, summarize all these things, but only Turkey, that was Turkey alone, uh, in addition to all other support, provided over 1.5 million euro worth goods uh, to Bosnia and Herzegovina specifically. Uh, they, because of that way of organization, very thorough one and coordination, they had all the detailed data and they also valued uh, their uh, support provided in kind. Uh, then, based on these results, we decided to organize our board meeting, which is organized several times a year, but to make this meeting focus on uh, these issues, on the issue of disaster management and preparedness. 
So we invited all our board members and we discussed with them uh, what we may more or less discuss today, what was the result of the floods and how in particular our member associations manage the situation. And then on the other hand, what should be our approach as a network in the future? There were many interesting conclusions. I will point out only at several of them. The first I already mentioned, most of our member LGAs said that they uh, didn't know what to do. Nobody expected that it will be so huge impact on the environment. Nobody expected that that many people will be affected. Nobody expected that that many municipalities will be hit. So it came as a surprise to everybody. And everybody organized themselves uh, and acted the, based on what they thought would be the right thing to do and based on the capacities they had. Uh, the best uh, case, let's say, is the standing conference of towns and municipalities in Serbia. They organized immediately, they were on the field, they were coordinating the municipalities, they were coordinating the international uh, help coming from our network and they also coordinated with the national institutions. And I'm not here to represent uh, this member in particular. Uh, you might get in touch with them for more details, but they really had a number of lessons learned from this uh, process. Uh, also, it's interesting to mention the role of the Bulgarian Association. Bulgaria was hit by these floods in very sensitive, politically sensitive period for them, when actually they didn't have the, go the government. So the National uh, Association of Municipalities in Bulgaria took this role to coordinate among all the stakeholders and uh, also to help a huge group of volunteers that supported these areas after the floods. And now, with the support of the association, they have established an association of volunteers in times of crisis. Then another uh, lesson learned from this process uh, from our member association is that it was really challenging uh, to have uh, uh, appropriate uh, inter-municipal cooperation and especially international cooperation was questionable. During this time, this was especially pointed out by Bosnia and Herzegovina because uh, most of the waters came from Croatia. They were joking that Croatia was the real root of the problem. And then there were no appropriate uh, uh, early warning mechanisms and uh, both on national and on international level. So they felt that something needs to be done in this area in the future. Also, most of them pointed out that they didn't know what to do, neither the association itself nor its members. So what they suggested the network to focus on is the, in the future is to identify um, the real obstacles in the legal, um, uh, in the legal um, documents that uh, can help uh, local government associations and municipalities to know their role in times of crisis. And they also suggested that the, the network itself, NALAS, develops a protocol for reacting in times of crisis on behalf of the local government associations. Based on these suggestions and many more, I just highlighted some of them, we decided what we are going to do in the upcoming period. Uh, we uh, operate based on so-called task forces in several areas which are of key um, uh, importance for the local governments and we have tasked some of our task forces, in particular those, those in urban planning and solid waste and water management, to take the lead and to produce a manual for local government associations on disaster preparedness and management, to list the policy issues relevant to disaster preparedness and management, and draft analysis network structure and protocol for acting in emergency situations. This has been just started to be developed as part of our activities in the future. And then very important aspect pointed out is that uh, many things we don't know. So in the upcoming period, we are, as a network, going to focus on capacity building for local government associations in disaster management. And we have already started to do this. That's it. Thank you very much.